The U.S. Naval War College is a Navy's home of thought. Established in 1884, NWC has become the center of naval sea power, both strategically and intellectually. The following Issues in National Security Lecture is specifically designed to offer scholarly lectures to all participants. We hope you enjoy this upcoming discussion and future lectures. Well, good afternoon and welcome to the 12th Issues in National Security Lecture for this academic year. I'm John Jackson and I'll serve as the host for today's event. Rear Admiral Chatfield is not able to join us today, but I'd like to extend a welcome to each of you on her behalf. This series was originally established as a way to share a portion of the Naval War College's academic experience with the spouses and significant others of our student body. Over the past four years, it has been restructured to include participation by the entire Naval War College extended family to include members of the Naval War College Foundation, international sponsors, civilian employees, colleagues throughout Naval Station Newport, and participants from around the world. We will be offering six additional lectures between now and May 2021. An announcement detailing the dates, topics, and speakers of each lecture will be posted by our Public Affairs Office. Looking ahead on Tuesday, 9 March 2021, we will hear from Professor Pauline shanks Curran, who will speak about racial and gender diversity in the military and society. Okay, on with the main event. Uh, as a reminder, please feel free to ask questions using the chat feature of Zoom and we will get them at the conclusion of the presentation. Nearly every day we see something in the press about the role of China in the Pacific. The South China Sea is the epicenter of China's maritime expansion and Beijing seeks to enhance its maritime security, regional status and access to resources. Pursuing these objectives increasingly puts China at odds with its neighbors, with international law, and with maritime states around the globe. Professor Peter Dutton will address these dynamics and questions such as, why do China's leaders press forward despite these challenges? What are they attempting to achieve? What makes the Chinese strategy so difficult to counter? And what are the policy implications for the United States? Dr. Dutton is a retired Navy judge advocate and former Naval flight officer. He holds a JD from the College of William and Mary and a PhD from King's College, London. He is an adjunct professor of law at the NYU School of Law and a research fellow at the US Asia Law Institute there. His research focuses on Chinese views of sovereignty and international law and how those views are shaped by geostrategic and historical factors. He frequently advises senior officials and military leaders across the government and has testified before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and the House Armed Services and Foreign Affairs Committees. I am pleased to pass the digital baton to Dr. Peter Dutton. Peter. Thank you very much, John. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be with everyone today. I'm looking forward to, uh, to, to uh, sharing my research and uh, the research of the institute from which I come, uh, the China Maritime Studies Institute at, at the uh, Center for Naval Warfare Studies. I probably should have titled um, my talk today, The Strategic Dynamics of the South China Sea, because I won't be dwelling too much on the types of disputes in the South China Sea, although uh, if during question and answer you would like to uh, ask about those, I, I have a lot of background in them and would be happy to talk about them. Um, I'm obliged to say uh, that what you're about to hear from me is my own personal perspectives, not uh, the, the perspectives of the Navy or, uh, or any other agency of the government. Um, and I'm also uh, grateful to say uh, thank you to the Naval War College Foundation for their generous support for the college and in particular for uh, the study of uh, China and Asia. Uh, by, by uh, those of us in, on the faculty. So thank you very much. So I'll go ahead and share my screen now uh, and we can, we can begin considering some of the issues. Uh, uh, so uh, Commander Ross, just give me a thumbs up or something if, if, this is, uh, if we're good at this point. All right, good, thank you, perfect. Um, okay, so 
uh, the three main themes that we're going to look at today uh, are, are the way China views security, wealth, and status uh, in, the, in, in the pursuit of its maritime expansion, which is centered around the South China Sea. So uh, just to get everybody oriented, uh, obviously China's that big pink spot in the middle. The South China Sea is just uh, the, right in the center of, of your screen there. Um, and you've, you've seen no doubt uh, in the news that there's been a, a lot of tension uh, between, military tension between China and the United States centered in the South China Sea. On your, on your left is a picture of a Chinese uh, bomber, an H-6 uh, that, that carries uh, uh, anti-ship cruise missiles, in fact. Uh, but on your right, you also see that recently the United States had two uh, carrier strike groups working in the South China Sea, operating uh, together and you know, demonstrating American intent to uh, ensure that the South China Sea remains an open part of uh, a free and open part of the Indo-Pacific. Um, I do want to point out that uh, because it can be very difficult to tell. Um, for those of you who have never been to the South China Sea, looking at that on the map, it's really difficult to get a sense of the of the expanse. Um, but one of the ways of of thinking about the South China Sea is that it's one and a, almost one and a half times the size of the Mediterranean Sea, right? So we're talking about a vast amount of ocean space uh, dotted with uh, uh, little island groups, the Paracel Islands in the north and the Spratly Islands in the southern part of it, uh, with Scarborough Shoal uh, uh, off the coast of the Philippines and Pratus Island off, uh, off, off the coast of, uh, of China. These are the four island groups in the South China Sea that, that China claims. Um, all of which are disputed by one or more parties. That Pratis is actually only disputed by Taiwan, uh, but uh, but there is a but there is an active uh, presence of the Taiwanese forces on Pratis Island. So there's a lot of tension in the South China Sea over uh, land features, over the over the water space, and who owns the resource rights to them, and and what is it that the international community has to do in this vast uh, vast water space is also disputed. So uh, just to, to uh, keep our focus, I'm going to give the bottom line up front. And um, what we'll be talking about is, uh, is China's maritime expansion. So what is an, a maritime expansion? Really, it's the active projection of China's growing national power out into the maritime domain in all of its dimensions. It's not just naval. It's, it's the Coast Guard. It's the it's, it's a maritime militia, and it's not just security related, it's also resource related. China's got an enormous fishing fleet. It's got an enormous um, uh, uh, maritime uh, fleet. It's also got a, uh, a large and capable uh, oil, hydrocarbon, um, gas exploration and exploitation capability as well. So it's this projection into the maritime domain of all of its national capabilities. And this is centered on the South China Sea. Uh, what are China's objectives? Well, they're, as, as John introduced, they're to establish and expand a security perimeter around China's coastline, to ensure Chinese wealth through uh, security of its trade, and then to enhance its status, China's status as a leading power in East Asia. But these policies, of course, challenge certain American interests and the interests of China's neighbors, uh, and also they challenge maritime stability in the region. So these are the, are the things that we'll be discussing. Well, here's the, the big guy himself, uh, Xi Jinping, um, who, who, as leader of China, has really begun a, a ramped up campaign to, uh, to advance China's interests in each of these three areas, wealth, security, and status. You have to look back um, you know, more than 200 years to begin to understand why this uh, security challenge is so, uh, is, is so uh, sort of hyper-focused um, in Chinese policy right uh, today. So at the end of the 1700s, the Chinese were a tremendously powerful continental uh, uh, empire ruled by the Qing, the Qing dynasty, a Manchurian uh, dynasty. And China was probably at the apex of its power uh, by the end of the uh, 1700s, by, by about 1800. But right about that same time, there was the beginning of internal instability. That, that over the next 40 years accelerated due to a number of factors, including population explosion and the inability to, to deal with uh, the, to, or, to, or to produce su sufficient resources to deal with all of the uh, increased population. 
And so internally, China had begun to weaken, even when it was at the apex of its power. And uh, that uh, led to a series of wars throughout the, the 19th century into the 20th century wars and then revolution. Uh, and then uh, after the Chinese communists came into power in 1949, 40 years of really fairly constant internal upheaval, um, resulting in, in a final upheaval, which was the Tiananmen Square Massacre. Uh, 1989, 1992, that, that time period after Tiananmen Square became a turning point uh, as China, uh, the Chinese Communist Party um, asserted control over the country and, uh, and began to generate the next uh, factor, which was wealth, um, consciously attempting to generate wealth because China has recognized long that wealth and security are related to each other. So uh, in, this, in this period of time, wealth and security uh, rose dramatically uh, in in terms of GDP per capita, uh, pulling uh, you know at least half a half a billion people out of poverty, and by some estimates, a whole billion people, um, uh, right, raising uh, to a standard of level that is equal to the global uh, um, uh, middle class. Um, and so China, now that it is uh, both wealthy and and uh, reasonably secure believes that it should have much more status in, in uh, agenda setting of the regional politics, but also rule setting. Uh, and, and so China has begun to assert itself more within the region uh, to, to uh, assert that status. So let's first start with, with security and we'll, we'll take a look at, um, at uh, how the Chinese think about security and, and the way the South China Sea factors into it. So I need to uh, begin by looking at two different fundamentally uh, separate approaches to security. So uh, some of you may recognize this, uh, this gentleman down here in the right-hand corner, uh, Sir Halford McKinder, a, a British uh, uh, a geostrategic theorist actually, whose uh, writings uh, extended from the late 1890s into uh, the, the late uh, 1940s. So he, he saw, um, enormous change around the world uh, through the First and Second World Wars and um, theorized that over history, this central part of Eurasia, this pivot uh, portion of Eurasia, um, was, a, was a, a very powerful position around which other countries on the Eurasian continent had to organize their security because that central pivot area had the capacity to generate power and to, and to uh, move at, at every uh, uh, corner around the pivot in order to bring that power to bear to achieve political influence all around its periphery. The only ones who were uh, not directly affected by this were uh, the maritime powers, those who were uh, in what, what he referred to as the outer crescent or the or insular states. So that would of course include North and South America, the southern part south of the Sahara of Africa, the, the island states like Britain and Japan, uh, and the island uh, regions such as uh, South the Maritime Southeast Asia and, and uh, Australia. These areas were uh, not directly subject to the influence of the pivot and therefore could generate power of their own through maritime means, through trade largely. And so generating uh, power through trade versus generating uh, power uh, uh, on the continent were two very strong positions in the world, according to McKinder. And they, they would uh, uh, clash in this area, this inner uh, crescent or marginal portion of the Eurasian continent. That would be the zone of clash between the two major powers. And we saw this play out in the strength of Russia and the Soviet Union, and then the strength of, of, of uh, Britain and the United States and the maritime coalitions that they were able to generate. So, uh, so that was uh, one, that is one way of looking at the world. Now, uh, Chinese uh, geostrategic thinkers believe that they can shift that pivot area to the right. In other words, rotate it 90 degrees to the right. And in essence, make China the pivotal area of Eurasia and, uh, and require all other states, including modern Russia, to generate security based on China's power. Uh, and, and still yet, um, uh, they, they realize that they need to deal with, they, the Chinese, need to deal with the maritime powers that stand outside the continent. But one key lesson that we can learn from this is that, is that whether the pivot is Russian or, or Chinese, uh, this land power generates security through concentric circles of control, decreasing control away from, uh, from the continent. And so 
You think of a bullseye, for instance, the center is the territory you need to defend, and then the decreasing rings of control farther away from, from the center. That's the pivotal, that is the approach of an interior security uh, uh, strategy to achieving security, this concentric circles. Well, the alternate uh, perspective is called the exterior security. This is essentially surrounding the bullseye, right? So um, this is uh, 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 the approach that the United States has taken. Um, and um, Nicholas Spickman, the gentleman down here on the right, was a, a geostrategist, a maritime strategist um, out of Yale University. He was Dutch, actually, but he, he uh, practiced and, and was a professor at Yale. And uh, he theorized that, uh, yes, it's true, there would be um, a contest between the maritime powers and the, um, and the central power of Eurasia, uh, and that there would be actually contestation in what he referred to as the rim lands of Eurasia. Um, but he, he theorized this exterior security strategy, essentially, as I said, surrounding the bullseye. Um, and, and he gave sort of a, a new uh, structured thinking to the way Britain and the United States had developed this strong ex exterior position around the globe by dominating the commons, right? Dominating the, the maritime domain, eventually the aerial domain, space domain, um, as the zone within which power would be projected uh, from, the, from, from the insular states to Eurasia. Um, and supported by allies along the, the continental periphery as NATO and uh, the alliance system in East Asia and, and in uh, the Middle East um, can now attest. So this is the American security strategy it requires us to have a very strong uh, position able to move uh, at will across the commons in order to bring power to bear into Eurasia as, as necessary. So what you see with China as an expanding interior security strategy, that is an expanding bullseye, comes directly into uh, competition with the United States, which has to project power across the, the oceans and, in, and be able to uh, influence events on the continent with resident power in East Asia. Of course, freedom of the seas becomes utterly essential to the uh, American perspective on uh, developing security in this way. So this is why uh, in littoral East Asia, there's a fundamental geostrategic uh, dynamic that, that results from two powers with, with divergent approaches to security, um, having to, to find a way to either coexist in the same space uh, or, uh, God forbid, to en engage in conflict over that space. So that's the, the dynamic of the challenge that we face today. So this has a long history in Chinese thinking. Um, what you're looking at here is, um, is uh, uh, the, the deeper red is uh, ancient Ming China. Now, before the Qing came into power in 1644, uh, the, the Ming dynasty uh, controlled China. The Ming were a, a traditional Han dynasty. Uh, and here what you see is uh, in, the, in the deeper red is roughly the extent of, of, Ming, uh, of Ming China. Although uh, to, to be entirely honest, um, uh, to color Taiwan deep red at this point is probably a bit of a stretch. Um, it really was uh, indigenous uh, people lived in Taiwan and it was not really controlled by the Ming. Um, and, and indeed, in the later portions of the uh, Ming period, the Dutch were able to establish a, a colony on, ta on Taiwan without any interference or even concern um, from, from the Ming. Um, ultimately, the Dutch were chased out by uh, Ming loyalists um, who established a, a small, short-lived kingdom in, in Taiwan of their own um, uh, until they were uh, defeated in, in the late uh, 1680s by, uh, by, the, uh, by the Qing. So, Nonetheless, um, what you see here is uh, in the deeper red is the extent of the Ming dynasty uh, at 1644. Now, the Qing I mentioned came from Manchuria. That's in the upper right-hand corner. Um, then there's the, Mongoli, uh, the Mongolia, and the Mongolians and the Qing were actually allied. At, uh, as, I'm sorry, yeah, the Mongolians and Qing were actually allied um, and uh, together, really, uh, under, under Manchurian leadership, under Qing leadership, um, they defeated the Ming, and the, and the Qing became, in 1644, uh, took, took power in the north in Beijing, and, and eventually were able to um, assume control all, over all of uh, uh, what you see in the deeper red there. 
And then uh, over the course of the 1700s, the 18th century, uh, the Qing dynasty projected its power westward and northward. Now, why would it do this? Why would it expand? Well, partly because it was um, a, a continental uh, fighting dynasty with, uh, with strong armies, and that's partly, you know, conquering is partly what it did. But it was also under uh, increasing pressure from the Russians, which as early as the late 1500s had come into uh, Siberia and put pressure both on the Ming and the, eventually the Qing dynasties uh, from, the, from the north. Uh, and there, were, there was tension between those two empires. And then eventually um, there was pressure from the, from the British in the south um, as the British became a, a presence in, uh, in the Indian uh, subcontinent. And, and, so, and so the Qing dynasty pushed outward uh, to develop a continental periphery that they could defend. Um, in, the, in the Northeast, they had a strong position in Manchuria guarded by rivers and, and mountains and, and, and forests. The same was true uh, to the north in Mongolia and to the west, they pushed out to the to the deserts and the mountains of the far west and were able to uh, build fairly stable uh, borders with a continental peripheral buffer that that was essentially the expansion into the continent of that interior security strategy that I referred to earlier. Much of this done was done by this uh, this dapper looking gentleman down in the left hand corner here, who was the Chen Long Emperor, who who uh, ruled for 63 years, really 66 years um, in the in in the uh, 1700s. He stepped down at uh, 63 years because he didn't want to uh, embarrass his his uh, uh, long lived. Uh, um, uh, for forebearer, uh, the, the Kangxi emperor who had ruled for 63 years, and he thought it would be unfilial to, uh, to, to rule directly for more than 63 years himself. But he ruled uh, through his son for three more years after that until he died. But it was under him that they conquered much of this territory, creating that continental buffer zone uh, in, in, in the expansion of that interior security strategy that I mentioned earlier to deal with the increasing uh, threats brought about by major strategic change in Eurasia by the expansion of new continental uh, competitors. What they failed to do, the Qing, that is, what they failed to do was to be able to secure their maritime perimeter, their per maritime periphery. Uh, that really wasn't too much of a problem. No single state on China's uh, maritime periphery, nor even any combination of states had the power to, uh, to attack China from the maritime uh, domain and to cause any uh, strategic concern to China from the maritime domain. Until when? Until after the Napoleonic Wars. Britain, through the Napoleonic Wars, had industrialized, had, had improved its governance, had expanded its empire, had expanded its trade, and had developed uh, such industrial strength that it was able to uh, create sea power, including um, uh, the Opium War in 1840 uh, was the first war in which the British uh, used um, uh, uh, steam-powered ships uh, as part of their, their warfare. Um, and so, uh, uh, with a relatively small fleet and well, relatively small landing forces, Britain from the maritime domain in, in the 18, between 1838 and 1841 was able to bring uh, the Qing Empire uh, essentially to its knees and to capitulate uh, to open trading rights uh, for, for Britain into, the, in, into what had been a relatively closed uh, empire with a very narrow trading system focused on Canton or Guangdong, uh, Guang, Guangzhou in Guangdong province. Uh, and so beginning in 1840, uh, the, uh, the Qing uh, had a, a series throughout the, the 19th century, the 1800s, of, of defeats from the maritime domain. Uh, 1840 and 1860, the First and Second Opium War against the British. They uh, were defeated by the French in 1885. And finally, they were defeated, defeated by the Japanese at sea in 1895. All these major maritime defeats left China in a very weak and vulnerable uh, condition. So what was clear was that although the Ming, uh, rather the Qing dynasty was able to develop its continental periphery, it failed to complete the arc of control around China 
to create a buffer zone uh, to, to, to secure China proper from an attack either on the continent or at sea. And China today is determined to, uh, to, to, to not to repeat the Qing's failure. And so this map here, which is a map of China today um, that shows uh, missile, uh, missile ranges uh, around China's periphery, I think does a very good job of both showing what an interior security strategy looks like, but also of uh, helping to demonstrate how China is securing not just its continental periphery, holding the empire together, um, but also securing its maritime periphery as well. I should have noted earlier that in the South China Sea, China claims those four island groups I mentioned earlier, plus essentially 80 to 90% of the waters of the South China Sea as being under its jurisdiction. Of course, we know China claims Taiwan and China also claims the majority of the water space in the East China Sea and the, the islands that are currently administered by Japan called the Senkaku. Uh, China claims them as the Diaoyu Islands. And so it's expanding into the maritime domain uh, with its missile power uh, in order to achieve in, increased security, but it's also attempting to legitimize its ownership of of both the islands and the water space in the East and South China Seas in order to project its national presence into those spaces. So my colleague, Andrew Erickson uh, uses the phrase, I think it's actually a, a rather popular one, but, but he, he, uh, he's the one who popularized it uh, to me. So I'll, I'll uh, credit him for it. That China uses the land to dominate the sea. Um, so, so uh, we talk a lot about China's growing Navy. It is a, a strong and growing Navy. It's an important Navy, but it's not what the United States is fundamentally concerned about when we think about the challenges of, for instance, defending uh, Taiwan or dealing with a crisis on the Korean Peninsula or even defending uh, Japan against Chinese um, uh, aggression should it occur. Why? Because China has tremendous missile forces, both ground-based missiles and air-launched missiles uh, that are, that are uh, it, it's an asymmetric approach to securing sea space. Obviously, the United States, as I showed earlier, has to project power across great distances and to sustain that power in the face of this rather strong uh, land-based uh, power in, in the region. So as I've, as I've also shown, uh, China is expanding its interior security strategy uh, quite far out uh, into the Central Pacific. But if you look at the red line there, that's a DF-26 uh, uh, missile, uh, which has both has multiple variants. It has a land attack variant, but it also has uh, 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 cruise missiles capable of attacking targets at sea. And you can see how far uh, China's uh, missile range can go from its uh, continental territory. Now, now to be honest, there's um, the farther uh, China gets away from its uh, maritime periphery, the harder it is for China to launch missiles into the maritime domain because of the problems of uh, search and, and search and location of the targets uh, that it's attempting to attack. So uh, I don't think China has the capability yet of attacking targets from land-based positions uh, into the Indian Ocean. But uh, it's my personal view that China is seeking ways to develop that. We can talk about that in Q&A later. But for now, China's focus is on its near seas objective and in particular, Taiwan. Um, developing control over the East and South China Sea is, is important to secure China's periphery. But in the end, uh, for the Chinese uh, government and the Chinese military, it's all about Taiwan. So China does maintain an overseas presence, mostly uh, overseas naval presence, although there is a growing peacekeeping contingent, for, in, mostly in Africa. Um, but when we talk about China going global, it's really a, a very different thing. Really what it's talking about is at best uh, presence or maybe occasionally reach, that is to say, um, the ability to uh, undertake activities in peacetime in uncontested areas beyond the, the missile uh, range that, that China uh, benefits from using the land power as an umbrella for its fleet. So uh, my view is China is uh, developing a, a global presence, but not a global sea supremacy Navy or a, a dominant Navy on a global basis yet. Now that's, we will come in a few minutes to what we might be looking for for that to change. So 
Um, as we look at China's maritime uh, expansion, as I've already mentioned, there is an operational dimension, which includes a, a growing navy. Uh, this is this is uh, the, the old uh, Soviet Varyag uh, carrier. Some of you may recognize the type that uh, China has refitted into the um, Liaoning. Uh, aircraft carrier. Um, it's got a growing navy, and it's it's now building its own indigenous carriers. It has launched one. It is uh, uh, building two more um, indigenous carriers, if I recall correctly. Um, but it's also got a uh, a, a really powerful, uh, a, a capable uh, destroyer fleet. So really, it's um, cruisers. Uh, what what well, large destroyers? It doesn't call them destroyers. Large destroyers, uh, medium sized destroyers, and frigates uh, that are really quite. Um, uh, quite advanced, um, but China uses the land to control the sea, as I've as I've already uh, mentioned, and so um, this is this is a fundamental challenge in a number of ways. It's not just the technology that's a challenge; that's certainly part of it, uh, but it is it is also uh, a challenge in that missiles are a whole lot cheaper to build uh, and to and to uh, and to field than it is uh, a fleet. And so China is uh, pursuing an asymmetric advantage in both directions. That is to say, uh, using the land to control the sea in ways that are asymmetric to us, but also um, uh, a much more cost-effective strategy uh, to address security concerns in East Asia. Additionally, uh, in addition to a Navy, China is very actively developing a large Coast Guard. Um, it has the largest Coast Guard in the world, uh, and not just in terms of the number of ships, but also in terms of the size of the ships. Um, China is, is building uh, um, Coast Guard uh, cutters up to 10,000 tons uh, of uh, 10,000 tons in size. And that is, um, that's roughly the size of a, of a good size destroyer. And, and, uh, and so what, what we're talking about are real um, um, powerful uh, Coast Guard vessels that are clearly meant to do more than simply uh, enforce laws against uh, small uh, fishing vessels. So China is using uh, not only its um, the land to control the sea, it's now using an asymmetric approach to generating law enforcement capability in the areas that it claims. This is what's referred to as the gray zone. I'll show you this later, but it's the gray zone in the sense that it's not war, and it's not law enforcement, not really. Why? Because China claims these waters, even though international law doesn't allocate them to them. Um, and, so, and so China has created domestic law to claim the water space and then uh, created domestic law enforcement capability to police and uh, dominate that space from other, other uh, participants who, who actually have a legitimate right to be in that space, like Vietnamese fishing vessels, et cetera. And so using a maritime militia, which are based on fishing vessels, and using a, their Coast Guard, they stay below the threshold of naval force, but nonetheless pursue a maritime expansion in a very coercive way that crowds out neighbors, but is less likely to involve the United States. This non-militarized coercion uh, has been an effective gray zone strategy in building Chinese power in the South China Sea. So uh, here's what I mean uh, when I talk about this. It's another way of looking at the problem. On the left, there are, there are various ways that the Chinese could resolve all of the disputes in the South China Sea, but they have rejected them. And on the right are the power-based options that they could use. I've already mentioned the non-militarized coercion and the armed conflict. But of course, diplomatically, they could negotiate outcomes. They could, uh, with you know, one, one country, they could uh, work together with multiple countries since there are multiple claimants or they could go to uh, international courts to resolve the disputes. Well, China prefers, of course, one-on-one -on -one negotiations where the power is in China's favor. When others try to uh, collectivize their power, such as working through ASEAN, um, China forestalls that, uh, that pathway because the power dynamic is, is, is not favorable to, to China. The Philippines, therefore, being foreclosed from the other uh, uh, approaches, um, went to an international uh, tribunal to resolve their dispute. Um, China, in response, accelerated this non-militarized coercion um, because the US has so far in East Asia deterred conflict as a, as a source of dispute resolution. So what the United States policies are attempting to do is to, is to move out of power-based options towards diplomatic or institutional options. 
But what we see China doing is pushing uh, out of those options toward power-based dispute resolution. The real problem, of course, is the escalation danger that that poses, bringing on the potential for armed conflict in the region, which is why China has focused on this non-militarized gray zone approach to its operations in the South China Sea and frankly, to the East China Sea as well. So we can talk later about the policy questions that this brings, but we have to ask what, what non-military tools can we bring to bear that can deter China's non-militarized coercion? Also, what can our military do to, to continue to deter Chinese aggression without escalation danger because, because nobody wants war between two nuclear powers? So let's now shift out of security into uh, China's uh, pursuit of, of wealth. So what is the problem that China is trying to solve? Well, this is actually a depiction from The Economist magazine of what is called the, the middle income trap. So what is the middle income trap? Um, the middle income trap is, uh, is a, is a uh, that, that center of the diagram when states start in the, bo in the, in the bottom left, this low income area, they are often, if they have the right condition, say a growing population, an educated population, lots of natural resources, but still they're at a low level of development. That means essentially they have a lot of latent development available if the conditions are right, such as good government regulation and openness to um, external investment. And so what you see, and this is fairly typical, is a period um, anywhere from 10 to 30 or more years of rapid growth as easy development is achieved, going from the low income to the middle income. What becomes very difficult is to move into the upper right corner, right? Where not only you begin to get rich, but you stay rich. Why? Because you have an economy that's based on innovation, that's based on uh, uh, not just production uh, or, or, or resource extraction, but on uh, high-end manufacturing, high-end innovation uh, and services, a strong service economy and including a strong domestic economy. So, so moving up into that upper right-hand quadrant is very hard to do. Uh, the conditions really have to be right. And so what, what keeps Xi Jinping up at night is, is as challenging as all the security challenges are, it's the, it's the middle income trap that Xi Jinping worries about. Now, some economists don't believe that there is such a thing as a middle income trap. Uh, I happen to be persuaded that it's true, but it's not even my views that's important. It's the fact that Xi Jinping talks about China being stuck in the middle income trap. Uh, he talks about it repeatedly in, in major policy speeches as the, the, the number one concern uh, to, to him. And so he's thinking about how to get out of that middle income uh, that, that place where China is stuck simply relying on manufacturing um, and, and achieves perhaps a modest level of, of, of income per, per capita, but never actually achieves a high income per capita GDP and is able to sustain it. That's what keeps him up at night because of, poor, of course, the competence of the Chinese Communist Party is really the only thing that keeps a single, pow a, a single party in power uh, indefinitely. So what are some of the problems that, that China is confronting? Well, you can see that they've been successful um, for really for two decades in achieving high income, but you can also see that the income level has begun to level off. The GDP per capita growth has leveled off over the last uh, roughly five to 10 years. And what are some of the headwinds that China is experiencing? Well, demographics is one of them. It's not just their size, you know, almost a billion and a half people, it's, it's, uh, it is in fact that they have an, an out of balance demography. demography. Um, what you ideally will have in, in being able to move uh, to high income uh, levels is a lot of the ratio of a lot of workers to few non-workers. Right, so, so uh, few people in retirement and, uh, and, and you know, uh, a, a big, a big, uh, working age, say from 20 to 60, compared to under 20 or over 60. And so you have um, favorable worker demographics uh, so that there's a lot of productivity within your society. But when you have fewer people supporting more non-workers, say lots of children, and in particular, longevity, and a, and a lot of people say living beyond um, um, uh, uh, working age, 
Now you have fewer workers sustaining more non-workers. And that's a, that's a that dem demographic problem uh, is something that China faces in part because of the one child policy. Uh, uh, but there's a number of reasons for that demographic challenge. Um, Second is uh, social expectations. Uh, Xi Jinping knows that um, as the uh, incomes rise, uh, middle income people expect more. They expect better schools, they expect better hospitals, they expect a cleaner environment, they expect better infrastructure. Um, and so social expectations uh, have a cost as well as, uh, as, uh, uh, as the investment into uh, future uh, industrial capability. So that's a headwind on China's economy. And then finally, geopolitics. As China's uh, policies have brought it more and more into contention with the United States, that becomes a drag on China's economy as well. So what you do see is Xi Jinping attempting, um, and really the Chinese leadership, not just Xi Jinping, the Chinese leadership over time, attempting to shift into more of the type of economic activities that do move you from the, the, the country from the middle income into the upper uh, right hand uh, permanent wealthy societies, um, such as services. Um, but uh, um, that, is, uh, that has been very difficult for China to do and to sustain. So one of the things that China is doing is reaching out. Now you can debate whether uh, the Belt and Road Initiative is in fact China's, China's grand strategy or even if it has much meaning, but we do know that China is investing externally. It's investing, it's investing in infrastructure around the, the Eurasian landmass and into Africa in particular. These are long-term investments. I can't underscore this enough. A lot of investments going into uh, China's periphery, particularly Southeast Asia uh, and into Northeast Asia as well, but Southeast Asia in particular, developing strong economic relationships there in part because uh, this, is, um, this is good for China's peripheral se uh, security. If you can tie these countries to China economically, you can also tie their policies uh, to, to China as well. But China's invest, so China's investing on its periphery in, in um, uh, Southeast Asia uh, through Pakistan, et cetera, and even into the, the stands in Central Asia, in part for wealth, but in part for uh, stability on China's periphery, right? So it's essentially a way of investing in security. But when you get to Africa, for instance, China is actively investing in things like resource extract, extraction, infrastructure, and also uh, betting on the long-term uh, demographics of East, a of, of, I'm sorry, of, uh, of East Africa. Uh, so for instance, Ethiopia, China, China has targeted Ethiopia as a, a country worthy of long-term investment. Why? Because it has all of the hallmarks of a future um, a country moving from low income per capita to at least middle income per capita. And, and China can be the one to extract the wealth through that process the way the West did in our investments of bringing China out of that from roughly 1990 to, to today, uh, bringing China out of low income into middle income. So I think China is attempting to replicate its own success, really the West success in China, um, through investments in places like Ethiopia and others, where uh, one of the things that I think will surprise you, if you if you look at the top 10 countries by demographics um, in uh, 2020, and then look at what it is in 2100, you'll see a, a lot of change. China, India, and the United States will be uh, still be the three biggest uh, uh, populations, but you'll see Nigeria, you'll see Ethiopia, you'll see Tanzania, you'll see Pakistan. Um, among the top 10 most populous countries in the world. All of these are countries that China is investing in uh, for the long haul, betting on uh, wealth for the future. Uh, so, so this is the process we can talk about later, what they're, what they're doing with the Belt and Road Initiative. I'd be happy to discuss it more later. But this is a way to generate wealth. Well, how does China reach these um, these investments, of course, through the sea. And what's required is generating security. So how does, oh, I should mention um, uh, China's investments in Africa, which I've already talked about. We can talk about that more if you like. Also in, in Europe, um, a couple of interesting facts have emerged over the last couple of years. One of them is that the EU as a bloc has become either China's number one or number two trading partner. Um, it depends how you look at it, whether uh, it's the EU or, or the ASEAN states as China's number one or number two trading partner. But what we've seen is that the United States 
uh, is China's number three trading partner, right? So uh, be, behind these, these other two. Now, you might say, well, okay, the United States is one country and these are multiple countries. Yes, except the EU is operating as a system, uh, a, a, a trading partner with a fairly significant um, uh, uh, trade pull uh, increasingly uh, positively towards uh, Beijing. Additionally, um, with ASEAN, yes, there's a lot of division within ASEAN, but here in trade, China has been very strong in developing um, RCEP, the uh, one, one trading system, and the CPTPP, uh, uh, which is the follow-on to the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership, which we, we abandoned. Um, and so China has uh, actually engaged as a block with Southeast Asians uh, quite effectively. So if you think of the United States as a trading block, EU as a trading block, and now ASEAN as a trading block, the United States uh, has, has come to number three. And I think that's an important um, geostrategic change for us to begin to think about, because of course, your trading partners are the ones that give you, uh, you have leverage over you. And uh, if China has two other trading partners equal to, or perhaps even larger than their trade with the United States, that dilutes our ability to uh, assert leverage through trade with, with China. So here's the intersection of what we've been talking about, generating wealth and security in the South China Sea. Now, some of you are probably aware that China has built a naval base in Djibouti. This is, um, there's a lot to say about that. Uh, the China Maritime Studies Institute has done a very good um, uh, amount of work on that. And, and I'm happy to talk about that in Q&A. But you can see in the black circle where that naval base is. That's the far left, farthest west that, that China essentially uh, can project power. And if you remember all the way back to that slide where I showed the concentric rings of missile ranges, they reach almost to, not quite, but almost to uh, uh, the Babel Mandev, the strait here uh, on, on which Djibouti sits. Um, and so China's, China's, this is actually within China's near periphery, if you think about how deep into continental Eurasia China's territory extends. Well, China's also got naval bases in the South China Sea. I'm just using this location. It's not exactly where they are, but I'm using that location to, to uh, generate the basic idea. So these are the East and West anchors of what I, uh, of what the Chinese are saying, but also we are observing is a move into the Indian Ocean region, moving out from the South China Sea. So China's ability to exercise power in the South China Sea is the maritime center from which it is moving outward. Connecting uh, those bases with friendly ports. Now, China has no bases yet beyond uh, Djibouti and the South China Sea, but connecting it with friendly ports, such as in Guadar in Pakistan and Chaopu in uh, Myanmar. Um, so we, for time, we won't focus on uh, Djibouti, but, um, but really what we're looking at is we're thinking about how China is moving outwards. We're looking at the politics of bases. Do they have this top level base um, where there's a permanent presence with a political commitment like an alliance? Well, China really doesn't have any of those today. They just have a permanent presence without a political commitment in Djibouti logistics hubs, logistics supports, friendly ports, all of those are useful in peacetime, but less useful in conflict. So my view is China is not ready to go, uh, go globally with its Navy, at least not in, uh, in a, a posture to try to assert sea supremacy on a global basis. So what about status? We'll end with this. So um, prestige matters a lot to the Chinese Communist Party. China's global prestige matters a lot. Um, and this is in part why China refused, you see the whole right side of the screen here is uh, a void of, of people. On the left are the, the Philippine uh, representatives and their lawyers at the uh, arbitration hearing for the South China Sea arbitration. On the right are empty chairs. China refused to participate in the arbitration. Why? There's number one is a matter of prestige. How could China possibly let a small country like the Philippines embarrass China in uh, a large international tribunal and possibly take something away from China? So China simply refused to participate in uh, the proceedings related to the South China Sea. But out of that came some very clear law. On the left, what you see is uh, in the dashed blue lines, a what the coastal states ought to be able to claim in the South China Sea. So uh, 
that's you see the dashed blue lines depicting Vietnam's exclusive economic zone, China's, the Philippines, Brunei's, Malaysia's, Indonesia's, etc. But China claims everything within the nine dash line. On the right, there's a better depiction of what that would look like. Essentially, China, China groups together the islands and then claims resource zones from them. Well, the arbitration tribunal said that that was patently uh, not lawful uh, according to the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. And so China's claims are not lawful, but yet it's asserting jurisdiction over that entire area within the South China Sea, regardless of the fact that international law gives the resource zones to other states. So we have to worry about that because um, there is in fact, there are in fact some other countries that have similar policies as you see here, where their exclusive economic zones, if they were to follow the China approach, could generate uh, a similar outcome and take parts of the Indo-Pacific away from that free and open uh, commons that is so essential to American security interests. Um, so, uh, we see here how East Asian maritime disputes are resolved does in fact have uh, implications for the global regime of law and power because, uh, because if China's approach, uh, that is to say power dynamics, uh, can exclude as a matter of law or, or power um, other um, states and their navies, then we have a big problem in our ability to achieve our interests in East Asia with our own naval power. So here we come back to the bottom line again. China is, is undertaking this maritime expansion we've discussed. It's centered on the South China Sea. China's objectives in pursuing this maritime, expan uh, um, maritime uh, uh, expansion are to establish a security perimeter, as we discussed earlier, essentially to complete that arc of control around China's periphery that the Qing failed to do to ensure China's wealth through secure trade, not just in the, with Southeast Asia, but into um, the Northern Indian Ocean and as far as Africa, and then to enhance its status as a leading power in, in East Asia and as a leading rule maker, not only in the region, but, but perhaps beyond that. And as we've seen, this challenges China's, uh, China challenges American interests um, in its approach. It also challenges the interests of its neighbors and it challenges maritime stability in East Asia. So with that, I'll stop sharing my screen and I'll be looking forward to hearing your questions. Well, Peter, thank you very much uh, for a, a very interesting discussion of a very, very complex topic. Uh, we've got time for about two or three questions here. Well, let's, let's start with one that says, that asks, is the US government appropriately structured to deal with the multi-dimensional aspects of dealing with China? And where should the policy coordination function be located? State Department, National Security Council, Indo-PACOM, somewhere else? Well, certainly not Indo-PACOM, in my view. Uh, that's not, that should not be a military function. Um, uh, you know, whether, probably it's not even the State Department. Uh, it's probably where those two come together. The political, military, and economic functions of our, of our government come together at the National Security Council. So probably policy coordination should be done there. I'm actually quite encouraged by the structure that has been developed uh, uh, for this policy coordination under the new administration. Um, there's, uh, Eli Ratner has uh, taken uh, a position uh, in, in uh, doing policy, Ch China policy coordination for the Department of Defense, actually for the Office of the Secretary of Defense. And there's a very good team under Kurt Campbell um, at, um, at the National Security Council that uh, will be doing this. And, and we'll see those positions fleshed out uh, throughout Treasury and Commerce. Uh, but all of those will have to come together uh, in, in my view, in the National Security Council. Um, and I'm encouraged that, um, that, that this administration has done a, a good job of putting together that, that, that kind of team. I mean, there, there were some very competent people in the previous administration as well, doing very good work on China policy. Um, uh, I think, frankly, uh, more people are needed to do that work than perhaps uh, the last administration relied on. And so I'm glad to see this administration fleshing, uh, fleshing that out. Very good. Uh, a questioner asks about China's propaganda machine, their use of social media, et cetera, to, uh, to convey their issues and whatnot. 
Uh, how do you feel about what they do and how do you feel about how the U.S. responds to that effort? Um, China has very sophisticated propaganda, uh, has a very sophisticated propaganda system. Um, that's the first thing we need to recognize, very sophisticated. Um, and uh, quite frankly, uh, is way out ahead of us. That said, um, probably the most sophisticated um, uh, um, propaganda system in essence is the American propaganda system in the sense that um, a free and open uh, press, a free and open dialogue, a free and open national dialogue, international dialogue uh, is, is a very powerful thing. Obviously it's, it's attracted, you know, there are many people attracted to the United States because of, of, this, of this level of freedom. Um, I would say, um, you know, that, that is in part why China has felt so um, pressed to come up with a, uh, you know, a powerful propaganda system to try to, to, try to counter this sort of independent, open uh, conversation that, that we have. Um, <laughs> that said, I will say, so I, I, I do uh, maintain a presence on Twitter, um, only China issues uh, and um, I, I occasionally see Chinese officials, um, you know, having having their way on Twitter, um, and I'm I'm deeply disappointed um, that uh, Chinese officials are allowed to engage in our conversations, but Twitter is banned in China, um, and so um, you know it's one of those things where um, uh, we don't have an entirely even playing field. Um, fortunately, we have the strength of an open and free society. Um, and uh, my, my view is that in the end, that, that's always uh, going to beat out over authoritarianism, but, uh, but we have to be uh, actively engaged in seeking out, um, you know, seeking out opportunities to be persuasive and to, and to generate conversation, um, you know, to, to push back against, you know, false Chinese narratives. For instance, um, the most recent one, uh, um, if it weren't so, such an incredible human tragedy, it would be laughable, um, is you know, Chinese officials saying that um, the, the uh, Uyghurs in, in uh, Xinjiang province are you know, happy people uh, going through you know, job training as opposed to uh, you know, oppressed people uh, forced into concentration camp and, and worse. I would encourage um, you know, the listeners to go out and actually learn more about what is in fact the incredibly horrible human rights abuses going on in China today that the Chinese government attempts to paper over on, on social media by simply saying, oh, well, this is, you know, you know people, are, people are being employed, uh, they're ha happier than ever, uh, dancing in the street. I mean, it's absurd. Um, so it's not exactly a, a le level playing field in that regard. I make a mark on my wall every day that I telework. I've now got 347 marks on my wall. Uh, has the pandemic uh, impacted on the ability of uh, China Maritime Studies Institute and others to uh, understand what's going on in China? I'd say the short answer is no. Um, um, the pandemic has, has not. Um, longer answer is uh, we certainly have had to shift our our, our approach. Obviously, we, you know, it's harder to collaborate. We we generate uh, a lot of knowledge through things like conferences and workshops. Obviously, that's harder to do. There's only so much Zoom time people want to put up with, <laughs> um, and so uh, there are certain things that we have to do that are different. But I wouldn't say that it's, you know, I, I think we've we've managed to be um, a highly productive. You know, honestly, what has um, what has become a barrier to us uh, are our policies coming out of the of the deteriorating relationship between the U.S. and China. I'm not, you know, I, I'm not commenting on the on the politics of whether our relationship should deteriorate or not. Um, you know, we we need to be uh, pursuing our national interest, plain and simple. Um, but I, but we are finding it harder to travel to China. We are finding it harder to engage with Chinese at all. Um, and these are important functions of our institute that uh, that do help us gain insights. But but so far we've been able to do good work, I think, um, right through the pandemic. <laughs> and and uh, uh, I, I haven't kept tally on the wall, but I do recall that the last time I taught a class in person was March fifth, twenty twenty. So we're coming up on a year. 
It's been a long year. Yes, indeed. Uh, one last question I think we've got time for here. And uh, the uh, commenter says that the uh, UN is apparently not very effective in working issues related to China. Is there any other international organization that is able to meaningfully stand up to Chinese issues? You know, that's a really good question. Um, short answer, short answer, no. Um, longer answer. <laughs> um, so, so all international organizations, you know, um, are to some degree a balance between power and and law, right? International law and the institutions that 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 um, develop and enforce that that law. But there's a balance between the two. So, you know, the United Nations, of course, um, can't you know force countries into the International Court of Justice. Can't do it. Um, um, the United Nations, you know, is 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 hard pressed, especially to drag uh, uh, you know another country before the Security Council. Why? Because that country has a veto on the Security Council. And so, you know, what you really have is some combination of international diplomacy. And by that, I mean, for instance, let's take the Uyghur example. You know, raising this question in the Security Council, you would, or, I'm sorry, in the General Assembly at the United Nations, you would think wouldn't be especially uh, controversial. This is a, you know, Canada just came out this week and labeled it genocide, as has both the Trump and Biden administration labeled what's going on in, in Xinjiang to be genocide. So it shouldn't be all that difficult to get um, the international community to, to you know, um, condemn what's going on there. And that would have profound political effect with, you know, possibly the ability to change Chinese policies. Well, what has stopped that? China is playing politics too. It's just playing politics with its money. And so the Chinese are um, generating mixed interests, right? Throughout many countries, Southeast Asia, South Asia, even you would think you would, there would be a lot of support for China uh, or, or, or for condemning China from other Muslim countries. And you don't see Muslim governments condemning China, why? Well, one of those reasons is the divided economic interests that countries have. Um, and so, uh, you know, that, that helps to dampen any tendency to criticize China. Uh, so I, I think what has to happen is there has to be um, clear um, uh, sort of taking the covers off of the, of the things that the Chinese are doing domestically and internationally. Some of them are good, but many of them are not. And so when, you know, when China is doing something that is not good, um, that needs to be um, publicized. And generating political, uh, uh, political co uh, cohesiveness to push back on China is a long-term effort that does have an economic component and how the United States pursues its economic policies. And it does have a security component and how we uh, pursue our security policies. So the link between politics, economics, and security is always present, especially when you're dealing with a great power like, like China. And yes, China is a great power. Is it a superpower? Not in my view. But it's a strong global power uh, when you're talking about economic and, and political power. And so you have to confront it as such. Uh, and that's the requirement, the challenge that we have ahead of us. I I'm happy to take a few more questions if if you all are happy to do it. I think we've got one last question and then we'll have to stop there. And that is, uh, is there a potential for the Chinese to convert their huge merchant fleet to some kind of wartime posture? Um, well, uh, yes. I mean, if you think of Lend-Lease and other things that, that, you know, that the United States does, has done in the past with our merchant fleet, um, uh, yes, I mean, there's certainly wartime utility to a large uh, merchant fleet. Additionally, um, there's uh, the real possibility of um, eyes, eyes and ears on a global basis, right? So in, informing uh, China of, of, of changes, you know, in, in locations of interest around the world. Um, so, so I would say, yes, I mean, there are, and, and we know that there are circumstances, you know, even as I can recall the Falkland Wars, um, you know, using Britain used uh, its merchant vessels to uh, support um, 
its ability to 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 bring the fight to uh, to to the South Atlantic. So, um, so yeah, I think there's utility, uh, but I mean it's a fairly limited utility. I don't think we're going to see China turning its um, large merchant fleet into um, you know into combatants anytime soon. Frankly, China, China has a pretty good size uh, fleet of its own. My colleague Andrew Erickson again has done some good work demonstrating that China's got the largest Navy in the world today. Okay, uh, uh, Peter, uh, any last comments you'd like to make before we uh, secure for the afternoon? Well, um, thank you so much. It's a privilege uh, to get a chance to share um, uh, the CMSI research with everyone. Um, you know, a lot of what I presented today is my research, but a lot of it's also, uh, you know, draws on my, my colleagues and I, I need to, to give them a shout out as, as well. I do want to return to the to the point I started with, which is um, thanking the members of the foundation, uh, because you know a lot of the research that we do um, is is dependent on the good, their good support, and uh, uh, you, you know hopefully you've you've seen the fruits of that support, and I I just am very grateful for it. So I'll, I'll leave it with that, John. Thank you. Very good. Uh, thank you, Peter. All right, we're going to take a five minute break and then we'll reconvene for our family discussion group meeting. So let's call that at about 542 and uh, we'll come back and hear from the uh, fine folks at the uh, Navy Federal Credit Union. So uh, we will now take a break. <laughs> 